LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Dada Mahesh Varananda, who joins us to discuss his book, After Capitalism, Economic Democracy in Action. A grassroots movement for economic democracy based on cooperatives and local economies is quickly growing throughout the planet. Inspired by P.R. Sarkar's progressive utilization theory, otherwise known as Prout, After Capitalism offers a compelling vision of an equitable, sustainable model which economically empowers individuals and communities. Filled with successful examples from six continents, as well as many resources, activities and tools for activists, the book offers hope that a new democratic economy is indeed possible. Progressive utilization theory was developed in 1959 by the late Indian scholar, author and activist Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar. Sarkar sought a practical alternative to the theories of Marxism or communism and capitalism. Prout is based on universal values recognizing and protecting the rights of all to the fulfillment of their basic needs, the protection of the environment, plants and animals, and a dynamic, incentive-based, multi-tiered economy with local and cooperative enterprises at its core. It encourages a balance in the effort of satisfying individual and collective needs. Hello and welcome, Dada, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's great to be here, Greg. Thank you. Now, today we're going to discuss uh, your book, which came out a couple of years ago, I think, After Capitalism, Economic Democracy in Action. It's actually a version adapted from a book you published about a decade ago. But before we dive into that, perhaps you could just give listeners a a bit about your personal background and your journey from where all this started for you until where you are today. Sure, Greg. I'm 60 years old now. I'm from the United States. And when I went to college in 1971, it was a very confusing time. The Vietnam War was still raging. I certainly didn't agree with that war. It was being fought in my name, you know, the United States. And uh, so I applied to be first a conscientious objector. Then I changed my mind and burned my draft card and wrote to the government informing them that I had broken the law and was no longer willing to go along with this war and this law. A friend of mine went to jail for two years, but They didn't prosecute me because there were so many people doing it at the same time, 500,000. So shortly after the war ended, I um, learned yoga and meditation as a hobby in 1974, actually. And I was surprised to find so much happiness and feelings of happiness, peace, and love that I more than I actually thought possible. So I, in, at the age of 24, I went to India and met the founder of this yoga and meditation, who was a political prisoner at that time for seven years due to his stand against corruption, the exploitation of women, the exploitation of the caste system, and exploitation by political parties, all which are very serious problems in India. And he inspired me to dedicate my life in service to humanity. So I became a monk, a monk of yoga. And I have spent the last 35 years as a revolutionary monk, working in Southeast Asia, Brazil, Europe a little bit, and now for the last seven years in Venezuela. Okay, now to get into your book, say After Capitalism, Economic Democracy in in Action, is pretty clear, spells out what sort of thing we can expect. But before I dive into just issues of the current um, global economy and what's happening there, what was your 
particular interest in economics and the politics of economics. How did you come to that? Was it simply because that's where you traced back the root of so many problems to? Yes, that's probably the best way I'd say it. There's so much injustice in this world. There's so much unnecessary suffering. For example, hunger. You know, the United Nations calculates that at this moment in time, there's enough food on our planet to feed more than our current population. So why is there hunger? There's hunger because there's a lack of political will. It's not a priority to feed everyone. So though the food is there, though we have the resources to get the food to the hungry people, it's not a priority. In the same way, poverty. You know, Prout supports that the five minimum necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, education, medical care, should be guaranteed to everybody. And the United Nations, again, calculates that to, to, to pay for that, for everybody who doesn't have those things, would cost almost 20% of the annual budget spent on arms and military every year. Only 20%. So, I mean, we don't need a new technology. We don't need, you know, beings from outer space to come and help us solve this. We have in our hands at this moment the means to end poverty and hunger today. We could do it. We should do it. Now, you mentioned a term there, which is very important here, um, prout. Perhaps before we go forward, because we'll be talking about this throughout, sure. you could just briefly explain uh, what that is, where that came from. Sure. Prout is an acronym for the Progressive Utilization Theory, which is an alternative to both global capitalism and to communism. It was founded by the Indian activist and philosopher Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar, the head of this yoga organization that I joined. And it's a model that is based on cooperatives, on the um, self -re economic self-reliance of every region of the world as far as possible, and on um, ethical values, and on uh, a spiritual perspective. So uh, environmental protection, of course, in ethical va uh, with the ethical values. So this model is an alternative that could work. And I promote this alternative in my book and in my talks and writings. Now, as you highlighted there, um, the idea of coming up with alternatives to capitalism or essentially, on the other hand, socialism or some form of communism. Sure. It's seen as very much a black and white situation. I mean, there's, there can be nuances, but for most people, it's left versus right, freedom versus slavery, capitalism <laughs> versus communism. That's how it's pitched to people in the right. mainstream media. Most people understand it in those terms. However, we've seen enormous problems in the world economy, particularly since the 2008 um, global financial crash. And mm -hmm. all the talk in political circles and mainstream economic, economic circles is, you know, we're however many years into recovery. doesn't quite look like that on the ground, but that's the talk. No. However, in your book, you assert really that this global capitalistic system is actually terminally ill. We're not just looking at it, you know, being ill and making a recovery that actually right. we're in the death throes now. And I'm just wondering what that would actually look like. Because I think for most people to consider that the current system, again, it's not worldwide, it's mostly mm -hmm. in the West, but right. what it would look like if that wasn't there, I think for most people that's inconceivable. Well, it was Margaret Thatcher who said there is no alternative. And of course, um, we disagree with that. We think there are many alternatives you don't have to follow global capitalism, the free market economy. It's, uh, the global capitalism is based on profit, selfishness, and greed. So it works well for some people, but not for everyone. So today, nearly half the world's population is living, suffering, and dying in poverty. So... Global capitalism suffers from inherent contradictions. And I mentioned four of these in my book. One is growing inequity and concentration of wealth. So instead of the wealth being, you know, 
being more or less with everybody, it's more and more in the hands of the very few. You know, the idea of the 99% and the 1%. And of course, the problem is not the 1%. The problem is the 0.1%, the very few. A second reason for the why I say global capitalism is terminally ill is that um, instead of using this wealth as has been done throughout the ages by rich people, they, you know, they buy lands, they hire people to farm the lands, they open factories, they hire workers. Now, in the last 30, 40 years, this has dramatically changed so that over, way over 90% of the investments done by the wealthy are not productive in nature. They're speculative. They're gambling on the stock markets, on the futures markets, on derivatives. And so this money is not creating, to any large extent, new jobs. The money is not circulating in the society. Another, and, and it's because it's based on growth at all costs. So it doesn't take into account the environmental costs or the human costs when people make investment. Another problem with it is, of course, uh, the actual petroleum, the peak oil. We're running out of oil, and it's very much based on, because profit, as soon as possible, as much as possible, um, is not sustainable. Nothing can grow continuously except cancer. And cancer will eventually kill its host if it's not, you know, gotten rid of. So this global capitalism has these serious problems. And we need something better, an alternative to give people hope and to make local economies flourish rather than a global economy. Yes, I think the, um, the endless growth model is starting to come up against some very hard limits now. And you know, the only real wealth is the land and everything that comes from that. And you, right. you mentioned speculation on money markets and derivatives. I mean, it wouldn't be possible to unwind all those speculative positions, you know, leveraged again and again, you know, however many times and it, into anything real. It wouldn't be possible to turn that into real wealth, you know, into farmland or whatever, because the nominal value of the derivatives and other similar instruments is so colossal compared to the actual wealth in the system so right this actual wealth on the planet is <clears throat> calculated and it's now one twentieth, one thirtieth of the total world economy because of derivatives yeah and that, a very small amount this productive actual wealth in the planet yeah. and that, that's one way or another it's got to end and it's probably going to end badly who it ends badly for is another matter but it, it, you know it can't go on no now when it crashes, I mean, you know, the crisis is an opportunity. And so none of us want to see more suffering. But at the same time, sometimes when things get worse, they, it gives us an opportunity to make them better. So that's why renewable green industries, credit unions, cooperatives, sustainable agriculture that grow healthy food, all of these are elements that can, you know, create vibrant communities that are a wonderful place to live. Okay, we, you know, spend less gasoline every, every year than we are now. We use less gasoline, each of us. But we can still have wonderful, wonderful lives, a much higher quality of life than what we have today. Well, I'm certain, I mean, I know there's, places in the world that have never industrialized along the Western model for various reasons and probably right. never will. And there's a spectrum that flows, you know, it's partial industrialization right through to what we see in, in North America and, and Europe, um, Australia and you know parts of Asia now. But there, I'm also seeing even in somewhere like here in the UK, which is, you know, almost as money minded as uh, North America, there is increase in localism that's most definitely happening whether it's in terms of money or whether it's in terms of food 
um, right. o- other similar movements and, and people are doing it. Sometimes they find themselves doing it and I didn't quite realize, but they're responding to a need consciously or otherwise. And there are a lot more people getting together cooperatively, whether formally, you know, as cooperatives, which we see a lot of food cooperatives here now, but it's right. it's bringing things back to a human scale based on what's actually available. Even local currencies are now talked about quite a lot in the mainstream media here. Right. Correct. And transition towns, which started in England, um, are, of course, growing with that idea of making sustainable communities. Now, one objection sometimes to alternatives to the free market, so-called, mm-hmm. is that uh, p- proponents are t- t- trying to penalize entrepreneurs, people who make things happen, people who are being creative, on and on and on. But, of course, it's not about that at all. And for people who say that for, for all its faults, you know, we do have a free market capitalist system at the minute. I don't believe that we do. I don't think it's at all free. I think we have crony capitalism. And that's not to say that if we just got all the cronies out of it, it would be perfect. But what we have now is very distorted. And a lot of the dysfunctions that we're talking about stem from that. It's true. And, and you know, most great innovations are actually done in teamwork. They're not done by individuals. Um, Bill, great, Bill Gates was a genius, but I mean, look how many people were helping him to develop all the products, his Microsoft and all the products that he's, he's able to do. So in the, same, the same with Apple and Steve Jobs and everywhere else. So it's, uh, you know, we can't hoard wealth. We have to share it. And a fundamental principle of Prout is to, uh, the progressive utilization theory, Prout is to limit the accumulation of wealth and create a maximum salary that's tied to the minimum wage. Now, you know, this sounds uh, very radical, a maximum salary, but actually in every country, including in the UK, there does exist a maximum salary in the government. A new federal employee gets a certain salary, um, and the top salaries are about 10 times higher. In the United States, the starting salary of a federal employee is $17,800 at last. You know. And the, a senior the president of the country, a general judge in the United States, gets $179,700. I mean, this is, this is determined. This is fixed. And though they can raise it slightly, it's only about 10 times difference. In Norway, which of course is a very healthy economy, it's only 5.3 times difference between the starting salary of a government worker and the highest salaries. And everybody considers that very fair. In the UK, you can check, but there are also pay, pay scales, pay grades. And uh, why don't we do the same thing in all of society? meaning we create limits on individual wealth, on individual land holdings, land holdings and on um, individual salaries. Well, the it would qu- allow a lot more justice and a lot more uh, vibrancy in the economy for everybody. Well, the question usually arises in people's minds, who decides this? Mm-hmm. And once somebody or some group has decided that this is the maximum that anyone can get paid doing a particular job, mm-hmm. what else can they decide on, if you say what I mean? So I'm I'm not trying to play devil's advocate here. It's just really right. to, to bring up some of the most obvious objections that people raise. You know, if you talk to someone in the street or in a bar or whatever, they say, yeah, 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 but, and that's usually along those lines, who decides? Well, who decides is the society. Yes, you need economists to study the matter and decide what, I mean, who decides now about the the government salaries um, nobody's complaining government employees <laughs> you know uh, maybe they want slightly more but yes there's general consensus both in the government and outside of the government that the salaries are more or less fair the prime minister is not complaining every day because his salary isn't isn't infinite no, it's considered fair. So in the same way, you could create fairness in society as a whole. Studying the matter, making proposals, 
compromising a little bit, finally coming with a proposal that people can agree on. Another great source of problems I alluded to a few moments ago was paid for politics, basically. And we have this, you know, like people often refer to it as a revolving door between Wall Street and the White House or Wall right. Street and Congress. And these sort of, there's enormous conflicts of interest here. And it's not quite merged to become one system. But I see it, particularly in the US, I see enormous problems coming out of that um, or other toxic blend. Yeah, um, you know, political democracy just doesn't, has so many significant flaws. Um, big money, party politics, and the mass media have more to do with the success and failure of a candidate than does his or her moral character or his or her position on current issues. And in poorer countries, corruption is rampant. Votes are even bought and sold. So yeah, this is all very serious. You know, um, there was this book that came out recently by Richard Wilkinson from UK and Kate Pickett, The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better. And they demonstrate that you know, inequality has a terrible effect on societies. It erodes trust, increasing anxiety and illness, encouraging excessive consumption. You know, unequal societies are unhappier for everyone, including the rich. And societies that are more equal in terms of physical health, mental health, drug abuse, education, in every sphere of life, they have a better quality of life. Those numbers, those things are all down. You know, the, the problems of society are all less when societies are more equal. Well, I've met a lot of different people in my life, and I have to say that I didn't find the richest people to necessarily be the happiest. And what I see, right. what we all see happening in the world now, some rather disturbing trends, we just have to see where they go, is a bit cliched perhaps, but you know, rich people withdrawing, I've been mean, talking about extremely wealthy people here, withdrawing into effectively, you know, gated communities that are virtually armored compounds. They're buying small sure. islands so they can go and live there. And they're surrounded by all this material wealth and they've got more money than they can ever spend. But as you say, the, the, the trends that are pushing society in two different directions, that's, that's not making a happy life for them. No, it you doesn't. Know? And where, logically, where does that end up? It ends up like some kind of science fiction film where they're inside a fortress and... The raging mobs are outside with flaming torches trying to burn the place down. That's where that ends. And that's why, you know, in a, in a just society, you can be friends with your neighbors. You're not living in fear. You're living in community. And community is such a, such a healthier environment to have for us and our kids and our future generations than living in prisons, as you said, anyone who lives alone is living an unhappy life. The more love we have and we give, the more love we feel and we enjoy. And also, I know this is a slightly tangential point, but I read an article by a, a medical doctor a couple of days ago, and she was speculating, is that why is it that some people who drink a lot, smoke a lot, and eat junk food can live to be very old and die of old age and be mm -hmm. happy and she but we all, I think we all intuitively know this but she identified other factors that were more important she said mm -hmm. if people are lonely if they right. don't have, if they don't have meaningful relationships if right. they're under stress all these things can kill you no matter how much mung bean salad you eat mm -hmm. that's true and that points to a, a, you know the deeper truth and to be honest we talked earlier about competitiveness and being creative and entrepreneurship and all those and I'm fine with that. I've got no problem. I mean, my kind of maxim is generally speaking, people should be able to do what they like as long as they don't hurt anyone else. Right. Now, most of the people I know don't actually want to aggressively compete. They don't want to get the keys to the executive washroom. They don't want it all. They don't want more, more, more. They actually just want to be happy with their friends and family and have a, have a decent life. They don't necessarily want to get up at seven in the morning to go to a job that they hate. And I think this comes through in your book that we can reorientate society to be about to be about people and not selfishly about humans versus the rest of the planet, but to no. be about what is it actually to be human? What is life? What are we here for? What is it we actually want? And as I said, I find most people don't want to trample over other people just to get a, a bigger piece of the pie. And this is why in my book, I, I focus in part on spiritual values 
because I point out that even though most economic systems don't consider spirituality as being relevant, um, all the indigenous peoples of the world just about um, considered spirituality very important. They felt connected to the earth. They felt connected to nature very much. They felt connected to one another and to all living beings. And this connection is what's missing in a materialistic outlook. When you only see money, when you only see material things as the be-all of life, then you're going to be unhappy. And when you feel connected with everyone and everything, then you feel like sharing. Then you feel like building community. And this is what makes life worth living. Well, if there were a class of people who genuinely were wanted to control things and they do want to compete aggressively with others who are like them, mm -hmm. perhaps they could go off and do that in some corner of the world and not be mm -hmm. wreaking the havoc that they are. But and it seems to me, it's always seemed this way, that people who have this lust for control, usually out of some inadequacy within themselves, they are very much want everyone to be pointing in the same direction. They don't want people to be like yourself to be able to highlight alternatives because if a genuine viable alternatives come to the attention of large numbers of people, there's every possibility that large numbers of people will say, hey, I'd rather do that. That sounds like a better life to me. I don't want your system. And if that happened, then we would have this tiny number of con maniacal control freaks <laughs> running right. their own little, you know, 1% or whatever it is corner of society. And there'd be the rest of us. And then, then we would see for real what people actually want, you know, how people would choose to live if they're free to do so. Sure. And this is where the media is such a problem, because when the media tells us that there's no alternative, when the media tells us that capitalism is going to go on forever, um, when the media tells us that the United States, you know, their empire is going to continue forever, um, people get confused. People think when everybody's saying the same thing that it must be true, and it's a lie. Just look at just look at advertising. You know, the, the basic principle of advertising is you tell people, buy this product and you'll be happy. Excuse me, I think that's a lie. You can drink Coca-Cola, it's really not going to make you happy. Um, you can buy a pair of tennis shoes, you can buy a new car, you can buy a new house. Happiness doesn't come from that, from things. Happiness comes from your heart, comes from love, not from things. Or, as written on the wall one place, the best things in life aren't things. Just speaking about the media, what has your experience been over the years, your changing experience perhaps, of the media reception to these ideas? And have you had any coverage, meaningful coverage, actually back home, if you could still call it that, in the U.S.? Uh, I don't call the U.S. home, but I think of planet Earth as my home. So I've had little coverage um, uh, a few radio, newspaper, TV um, interviews, but nothing much. Um, yes, corporate media is not interested in alternatives. Corporate media is interested in what counts, money. And this alternative doesn't help anyone. It's kind of like, you know, the last century, we saw this great battle between communism and capitalism. And for the most part, communism lost. Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, all these countries collapsed. The communist governments collapsed, and capitalism won the day. But, you know, there's three ways to run an enterprise. One is private enterprise, and capitalism tends to be very dogmatic in that respect, saying that as far as possible, everything should be privatized. Then you have state-owned enterprise, and communism also tended to be very dogmatic, saying that as far as possible, everything should be state-owned as far as possible. But a third way to run an enterprise is cooperatively owned. And this has, for the most part, been invisible. For example, the statistics, you know, like more than a billion people on the planet, that's, you know, one-seventh of our global population, are members of cooperatives. 
the cooperatives create 100 million jobs in the world, whereas all the corporations put together create only 80 million jobs in the world. So cooperatives create more jobs. Cooperatives are also much more likely to succeed than private enterprises. In, in the United States, for example, in the first year, 40 over 40% of private enterprises fail. They go bankrupt. It's hard to start a business. Only 10% of cooperatives are failing in the first year. And by five years, you know, the failure rate is over 60% in the United States, and it's only like 12% of cooperatives are failing. But you don't hear this news on the CNN Business News. Why? Because the CNN business news is for investors, is for people who have a lot of money and they want to buy and sell things and they can't buy a cooperative. You can give a loan to a cooperative and get a small return, you know, interest as you're repaid, but you can't buy it, you can't sell it, you can't break it up, you can't control it. So there's no Dow cooperatives <laughs> for the CNN to report every day. But cooperatives do exist, and they do work. Yeah, there's an organic food cooperative that I've been buying food from for many years. It's in the in the neighborhood here. And uh, vacancies, generally speaking, never come up. You know, the opportunity to become a member, people just never leave. And I think there's people who've been there since it started in the early 70s, and they're still working there. They're still happy. And part of the reason is because... They're not earning a lot of money, but they're earning more than you would if you went to work in a supermarket or in Starbucks, mm -hmm. you know. They're earning an amount of money that they can live a decent life on. And for most of them, are, you know, all of them in the cooperative certainly are happy to do that. And as I say, most people I know, myself included, would be happy mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. They're earning a living wage, which is adequate for life. Now, there's this idea that comes up as well in the book about, you know, economics and how that's, you know, the dismal science, as they call it, but how that's generally regarded. And most people, when they think of it, um, if they do it all, then it is, in fact, a, a science. Dispassionate uh, eco economists look at things as, you know, how they are, not what they would like them to be. But actually, when you get down to it, economics is as much affected and infused with ideology, with politics, and with, with human emotion as anything else. And this is why mm -hmm. I've found, I did economics at high school, and I have found most mainstream economic analysis and thinking to be at least somewhat flawed, if not complete hokum. It is. It's not a science. Economists cannot predict uh, whether inflation will go up or down. They can't predict the, the growth or failure of businesses. You know, They can make guesses, but they can't predict with any accuracy. Um, they, you know, the, the inflation rates changing, the, the, the money supply is changing. These are all beyond them. There was a study recently in the in the UK itself about uh, debt, and debt is one, of course, one of the serious problems of capitalism. Um, corporations are encouraging people to buy on credit. You know, they to go into debt. You know, they they make these these campaigns. Visa says life takes Visa, and Mastercard is priceless. You know, Citibank live richly. Use your credit card, buy on credit. And yet the problem is too that people in debt suffer terribly. There was this uh, survey in 2010 in Great Britain. They found the debt problems have a negative effect on people's close relationships, their health, and their ability to carry out the jobs. Most of the people in this Great Britain, you know, in this British study, um, they hid the fact of their personal debt from their partners, their friends, their parents, because they said they felt shame and embarrassment. Why? What did they do wrong? They got in debt. <laughs> that, that, you know, that they bought more, they spent more than they they could pay off, for example, if they lost their job, suddenly they can't make all the payments again. So it gets nastier when these finance companies actually prey on poor people and actually use practices, you know, like like predators to uh, increase their debt 
and to squeeze profit from people who don't have it. It's uh, tragic. Oh, we have. I mean, there's huge problems with that across the entire industrialized world, and of course, different forms of debt plague other parts of the world too. But we've got huge problems with that in Great Britain at the moment, being reported in the media constantly. And of course, it's the the lower end of society. I don't really like to use that sort of term, but just so I think most people understand what I'm getting at, that they tend to be more vulnerable to getting into debt and also into not being experienced in dealing with the issues around debt and what the help mm-hmm. that is available. And of course, these people are often portrayed as feckless, and no doubt some of them are, that they went out and they bought televisions and other stuff that they couldn't afford and well they got themselves into this they've got to get themselves out but uh, you mentioned advertising but these are people that from the other side have been pushed and pushed into acquiring debt because that's the way to be happy you've got to have stuff so i'm not saying the people like this are without blame but how we handle it is another matter and i say when it involves uh what we call here payday loans which is people just living paycheck to paycheck and actually increasing debt you know, enormous interest rates payable on these loans. And then, you know, bailiffs, companies coming around taking people's stuff by force. We could we could deal with it better than that. We certainly could. And the terror, you know, the U.S. consumer debt is $2.45 trillion now, which averages $16,000 per household. Now, this $16,000 is just credit card and payday loans. This is not not including house loans, mortgages, doesn't include car loans or student loans. No, no, $16,000 average per household is just credit card debt. And that has terrible interest rates. So this is where they prey on poor people. You're quite right. They encourage you to go into debt and then they steal your money when you try to pay it back because they keep taking higher and higher interest. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible, you know, if, to prey on poor people, that's a terrible crime. And I, if you were looking off into the world decades in the future and how you would like to see think, things change, what do you think that would actually look like in terms of the balance of wealth changing? Because, you know, words like redistribution always get you know, people's shackles up, particularly capitalists, they've got visions of money being seized and millionaires being kicked out of their mansions. But what would the mechanisms be if we did start working in a more cooperative basis that would gradually change the, the scene over the course of developing decades? Right. Greg, definitely it involves communities. When people are a part of a community, when people feel a part of a community, they feel happier and they feel more fulfilled. So building strong communities and creating full employment, this is where cooperatives are so good at. Cooperatives, you know, a group of people decide, they they determine a niche, they determine a need, a product that's needed, maybe it's organic food in that community, more organic food is needed, or a service that's needed, They can provide that service or product. They create wealth. They create an income for all of them. And because it's a cooperative, it's economic democracy, then everybody benefits when the enterprise is successful, not just one person, one owner, or a group of investors, stockholders. No, the workers themselves benefit. So there's an incentive for them to share good ideas, to act on those good ideas, to make the enterprise more and more successful, especially because cooperatives in general are working on the local level. They're selling directly to the community. The profits of their enterprises stay within the community. The money circulates among more and more people in the community. And so you have vibrant living communities where everybody has a job, everybody has enough to get by, and everybody has a good quality of life too. That's the real vision for a better world. It's green, it's environmentally friendly, and it's fundamentally sustainable. What happens to hierarchy in a situation like this? Because some of what you've just described 
people would say, well, that sounds a bit like a, you know, a communist c- collective. But of course, in the communist system, you had people in, you know, palaces lording it over the rest and, uh, you know, dishing out orders. And they were fine wine and sweetmeats, you know, and everyone else was eating potatoes. So there was still a, right. a structured hierarchy in, in a communist system. Right. And that was one of the many failures of communism is it created a, a new class of elites and uh, yeah, and trying to say that everybody should get the f- same, that's very difficult to do. There should be incentives. If you study hard, if you work hard, you should be able to improve your family's income. So people want some kind of incentive like that. And that's why... You know, the gap between the rich and the poor should be drastically decreased, but it shouldn't ever be reduced to zero. Over time, the the gap can, you know, become smaller and smaller. But just as the government in Norway has a five-time difference between the starting workers and the highest-paid government employees in Norway, in the same way, you know, the difference should never disappear completely. But income isn't the only way that people are happy. People are also happy when they get more influence, when they can <clears throat> do the work they want to do, when they can have more you know, contacts and more networks of support. So there's a lot of ways to make people happier that's not just increasing their salary. Yes, I interviewed someone about the idea of changing the economic system. Basically, it was centered around land tax and and various other ways of structural uh, reform. Right. And he actually mentioned in this conversation, incidentally, that uh, in the society that he kind of envisioned that people who, who, you know, people would actually earn less for doing work that most people would really like to do. So, right. uh, you know, whereas in jobs that were undesirable but needed to be done would actually be higher earning, which is sort of the, the, the complete opposite to what it is now, for example. Maybe the guys who go out and collect the trash would earn quite a lot of money because it's smelly business. Maybe the guy who has to go into the sewage system to clear out a blockage, that's a really unpleasant job. Maybe he'd be really well paid. Whereas someone who gets to do, oh, I don't know, arrange flowers or, you know, look after puppies and kittens, maybe they don't earn so much because, you know, the people are clamoring to do that work. That sounds like participatory economics or Paracon that Michael Albert developed. Um, it's a good idea. I think there. I think that's one of the reasons to pay people more. I think there can be other reasons. I don't think everybody needs to have exactly the same salary, but definitely the the, the incentives should be less than they are today. In the book, you talk about you know human values and right. the idea that um, you know we've known certain type of morality which has been with us for thousands of years and that that would somehow have to fundamentally change and how can you change human nature but it occurred to me that a lot of quote-unquote popular morality the way a lot of people believe they see the world uh, a, a lot of that underlying the situation the problems we're facing now that's kind of coming from the top down that's being yeah. fe- fed to us by governments by media by advertisers so we think we have an idea about human values, but actually, as we're kind of exploring through this conversation, it's not really what they are. They're being distorted by the system. So we're not looking necessarily at changing human nature, more at getting back to human nature, it seems to me. Yeah. It's interesting that crime and violence are increasing in both steadily in both so-called developed and undeveloped countries, despite tougher laws, longer sentences, more prisons, you know, more police. Um, So we need to transform. We need to rehabilitate, again, people and not just punish them. Punishing is a terrible ethic. Uh, And you're right, for hundreds, thousands of years, really, the laws and the social norms have been created by the people in power to stay in power. So, for example, religious leaders in many parts of the world for hundreds of years have taught that in some mysterious way without any evidence whatsoever uh, men are somehow spiritually superior to women 
What nonsense. But if you want to make half the population be servants for the other half, it's very effective to create this kind of inferiority complex in people, in women. And so it's been done. Uh, in the same way, property rules. You know, I met somebody, a lawyer in India, and he was explaining that in all the Commonwealth countries, all the former colonies of Great Britain, the laws about um, against smuggling, uh, against customs uh, and, and tax, were often more severe than violence. You often had people going to jail for longer terms for smuggling and not paying the tax to the crown as if people committed murder. So it's interesting that these laws about property, the laws about what you know, the values and even religious uh, values that have been taught are not necessarily at all beneficial for humanity in great part. We need cardinal human values, you know, that are universal, like kindness, honesty, courage, mercy, humility, self-restraint, compassion. These qualities can be considered virtues in any society. And by teaching these kind of values, self-restraint, humility, Hollywood doesn't teach those values. By teaching these values in schools at every level from kindergarten to postgraduate level, we can make people better. We can become the best that we possibly can be. And we can learn that we can be happier by sharing than by being selfish. We mentioned discrimination against women, and I think that despite the advances in women's rights over the course of the 20th century, that what's happened is that in many cases, women have been given permission to be like men, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically you know, Margaret Thatcher, great poster girl for this, basically, you mm -hmm. know, act like a man and maybe you can get ahead in a man's world. And when you look at, particularly in other parts of the world, non-industrialized, uh, for example, uh, most of the most of the farmers in the world are women. The last time mm -hmm. I looked, uh, that, right. and uh, there's a lot of cooperative working that goes on in other parts of the world that involves women much, much more. And women are more likely to be cooperative and less competitive than men, anyway. Right, it's true. And uh, you know, the liberation of women, the awakening of, of women, is very important. We need quality education for all girls and women to overcome any sense of inferiority complex has been imposed over the centuries. And we need consciousness raising to change the behavior, the attitudes that aggravate sexism and racism and xenophobia. And we need economic democracy too because when women are economically independent, then they don't have to suffer relationships that are exploitive. They have their own income. They don't need a man just to survive. So cooperatives and economic democracy is essential for, to free women from that. And finally, we of course, we need proper laws so that society is just for men and women to stop any physical or psychic abuse and exploitation. Now, some people listening to this have no doubt, if not dismissed it, have been tempted to dismiss it as utopian, uh, something along the lines of the Venus Project or the Zeitgeist Movement. I'm sure you're probably familiar with those ideas. Sure. Um, but when I look at the other side of the coin, uh, and people might say, well, this is just isn't viable in the real world. What's rapidly becoming clear with the current economic and political system we live under, that's not viable either. Just because it's still staggering and wheezing along doesn't mean that that's long-term viable. It's not. It's, it's worked for a certain amount of time, but it's clearly coming apart. So I guess the question here is the Prout model that we talked about earlier, you've in the book explain where that's happening elsewhere in the world. And it's sort of these systems are working. They are up and running. It's just not widespread. So the question of how viable this is, is gradually being answered. Cooperatives are answering that question. Cooperatives are proving to the world that it's possible um, 
to, to work cooperatively, to share their, you know, the income from the enterprise. And there are models of sustainable agriculture all over the world that are proving it's possible to feed ourselves. We don't need the global economy. We don't need to import food from the other side of the planet to eat every meal. And we can actually live healthier if we have locally grown food too. Um, so these, yes, there are models throughout my book in Africa and in all the continents of the world actually where people are using these principles of the progressive utilization theory in Prout to demonstrate and, and create models of a better life for everybody. Well, a lot of people in the UK <clears throat> may not have considered that they have a, a long-standing, well-developed cooperative right under their noses, probably in their own high street, and that's called the co-op. <laughs> right. And it started out as a supermarket many years right. ago, but that, that's a, an old, long-established business. Now, they later got into banking, and they walked the walk there, but then, of course, well, not of course, but they ended up getting their noses somewhat dirty in the whole um, financial unraveling of you know 07, 08. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still a, um, a business runs there, you know, running uh, department stores and uh, supermarkets. Sure. So it's actually owned by the staff. Sure, of course. And a lot and, of uh, credit unions. Credit unions are another example of an alternative to the banking, uh, the co big commercial banks, where the credit union focuses on giving loans to local people, individuals, local enterprises, businesses. And so you get less profit than you do, but it's much more secure. You get a higher return of repayments of loans in a, cooperative, in a credit union, a cooperative bank, than you do in a corporate bank. Yeah, and a lot of people, uh, when in the, in the boom times, let's say certain parts of the 80s, early 2000s, people looked on, certainly in this country anyway, as credit unions as something kind of quaint from a, a bygone age. But we're now seeing in terms of numbers that uh, they're really coming into their own and there's, there's a lot of interest in them because people are, rightly, whether they're in debt or not, they're, they're sick to death of the behavior of the, uh, the mainline banks. Um, mm -hmm. Ditto with the cooperative itself. Um, I never quite understood this, but people would work out how the cooperative functioned and they would say, oh, well, that sounds really good. But they, mm -hmm. wouldn't, they wouldn't seek to take it any further than that. They would just say, oh, you know, I wish I could work in a job like that. You know? And if everybody that thought that did something about it, or maybe, who knows, start their own cooperative, who knows where we might be. Credit unions are more successful, actually, than corporate banks. They, uh, you know, they're growing. And they, and they focus on, as you said, the local investments, just as local cooperatives do, your local food co-op. They really care about their customers because the customers are their members. So you have, a, you have an opinion, you have a request, you have a complaint, they'll listen. They care. And that kind of community enterprise, worker-owned enterprise, it's, it's a great way to live. And towards the end of your book, uh, just to remind yes, Greg, yeah. just to remind listeners once mm -hmm. again, it's after capitalism, mm -hmm. economic democracy in right. action. You have a lot of tools, um, suggestions, and resources there for people who are perhaps interested in taking something like this further. Yes, yes, there are web pages. That are you know, I, I'm the director here in Venezuela, in Caracas, Venezuela, where I live, of the Prout Research Institute of Venezuela. We take volunteers from around the world. We've had over 50 volunteers work with us since we started, and uh, people come for any length of time. And uh, we also have an uh, organic farm close by, uh, two hours out of the city, uh, that's women's run. Uh, I think it's a fascinating project. Um, so, yes, there are a lot of possibilities, and there are projects all over the world that you can connect to. Transition Town Movement, I have to mention them. You know, a wonderful example that you can participate, you can be a member of, and you can actually influence your local community and your local place. Well, before I let you go, Dad, I've got to ask you about living in Venezuela, how you came to be there in the first place, and uh, perhaps give us a bit of insight into the Venezuela that, that you know, as opposed to the one that we get 
<laughs> you can imagine, right. <laughs> even now that Chavez is gone, I mean, we, we, it's still, um, I suspect, quite quite heavily weighted with propaganda. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I, I've done social service work for 35 years in Asia, Europe, and Latin America. I had visited Venezuela a few times, and after the World Social Forum in Caracas in 2006, I decided to raise funds to start the Pratt Research Institute of Venezuela. I had several reasons. One reason was that I love the people of this country because they're so friendly, kind, and spontaneous. But more than that, there are many goals of Pratt that are the same as the goals of the Bolivarian Revolution, such as guaranteeing the necessities of life to everyone, to be self-reliant in food and uh, you know, the minimum necessities of life for workers to manage their own enterprises. Chavez was calling for a socialism for the 21st century, but he admitted that he didn't know exactly what that means. Sarkar is called Prout Progressive Socialism, and I believe that, in fact, Prout is the most logical and rational type of economic and social system that will benefit all Venezuelans. So we're um, working here, we're able to talk to everyone. We're talking the same language because we have the same goals. Um, there's been tr- dramatic increases in the quality of life in Venezuela. But poverty has gone down 50%. Absolute poverty has gone down 70%. Um, university enrollment has doubled. Um, and there are now free universities and free university courses that people can take. Um, health care, there's free health care for everyone, as there is in the U.K., of course. So there are really um, very impressive improvements in the quality of life. There are problems. One of them is uh, corruption, which is an old problem, but it's not going away. And the other one is crime, which should be going away, but... For various reasons, it's still a problem in Venezuela. But overall, the people are excited. They're happy with the Bolivarian Revolution. It's improved the life for more than 50% of the population that was in poverty before. And they don't want to go back. They want to go ahead with their lives and with the way their society is developing. Well, Dada, as we bring things to a close for today, we've mentioned all the resources in your book. Um, are there anything online you'd like to point people to, website, any other uh, online sure. resources? Our, our website is www.priven, P-R-I-V-E-N, priven.org, O-R-G. And uh, that's the best. Another one is Prout Globe, Prout P-R-O-U-T-G-L-O-B-E, ProudGlobe.org, is another excellent site for news and analysis from the proudest perspective from around the world. Uh, Those are two sites I can recommend. Wonderful. Well, Dada, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you so much, Greg. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please check out the website, that's legalizefreedom.com, legalize-freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy, and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.